blown out windows, blackened balconies and the blanched faces of terrified civilians have come to mark Russia's war on Ukraine. But this is a Russian city. Ukraine has brought the war over the border. Cars were burning, people were crying and running out of the house, this local says. This government worker offers to evacuate these Russians to a nearby school. In the early hours of Sunday, civilians in both countries woke in fear. Fifteen people were wounded in these apartments in Russia's Kursk region after Russia said their air defences shot down a Ukrainian missile. While in Kyiv, a father and son were pulled from the rubble of their home, killed while they slept in a Russian barrage. For nearly a week now, Moscow has been struggling to halt this daring Ukrainian advance into Russia. They've released videos like this showing them striking back. Six days ago, Ukrainian forces launched a surprise attack into Russia's western Kursk region. Since then, they've advanced 30 kilometers inside Russia. It's forced Moscow to reportedly redeploy some troops from the front line in eastern Ukraine. Moscow has been throwing everything they have at the east, with Russia gaining ground in Donetsk. Ukraine has been struggling with manpower and Russian soldiers had been inching closer to the strategic Ukrainian town of Pokrovsk. Ukraine had been tight-lipped on this cross-border offensive until last night, when Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said his forces were pushing the war onto the aggressor's territory. I'm grateful to every unit of the defense forces that has proven that Ukraine can restore justice and maintain the necessary pressure on the aggressor. Here a group of Ukrainian soldiers film themselves raising their flag in a Russian village over the border, while other videos claim to show Ukrainians taking more Russian prisoners. What's new here is that they have gone into Russia and they've taken and held territory. And this is a very well-organized operation that was kept very much under wraps, so it was a huge surprise to the Russians. And also, very importantly, the Russians proved to be completely unprepared for this. We also saw this last summer with the Prigozhin mutiny. The Russians aren't preparing for things happening within Russia to this extent, and they've been caught flat-footed both times. Scenes like this on Russian state TV will rattle a public largely shielded from the war on the other side of their border. They've declared a state of emergency in Kursk and evacuated around 76,000 people, some into tents. For so long, Russia has been dictating the dynamic. Now they're having to respond to Ukraine shifting it. Well, joining me now is the Director of Military Sciences at the Royal United Services Institute, Matthew Savile. Matthew, thanks very much for coming on the programme. Uh, the Kremlin said, rather sniffily, that they don't see any military point in this operation. Are they right? Good evening. Well, I mean, we don't really know at this time what the full scope and objectives of this are. It's certainly in terms of scale, the largest conventional uh, incursion into Russia by uh, Ukrainian forces since this phase of the war started. Um, but there's a whole host of things that it could achieve, both in terms of propaganda, uh, there are tactical benefits to it, but there are enormous risks for the Ukrainians as well, given the extent to which it's probably stretching their lines and pulling in reserves that they would, in the normal circumstances, rather be using elsewhere. When I spoke to President Zelensky in Kyiv at the beginning of the year, he said in English, very pointedly, no one likes a loser. Do you think this has to do with the kind of run up to the American elections and questions over the, the future of Ukrainian funding? And they want to make a point here that they can achieve such a victory. Um, it might be the case that they are trying to show that they are fundamentally still in this fight and more to the point that they're capable of going on the offensive. The narrative of the past six months or so has largely been one where they're on the defensive and losing ground slowly, but losing ground to the Russians. And so if you were looking to bolster international support and show that there is still value in basically investing and supporting the Ukrainian military, including into next year, which will be critical, then this would be one way of doing it. Although 
as I said, there are some serious challenges here and in some respects we might need to look back at this in weeks or even a couple of months to see what the long-term effects were. I mean, so far Ukraine has been the defined victim uh, in this war. Is there a risk here, especially in international capitals amongst friends, that if they get too aggressive inside Russia it might be a backlash against them? Well, I mean, I think they've already tried to draw out a contrast between how their forces operate on the ground and the Russian forces, who obviously have committed what, for all the world, looked like enormous war crimes uh, when they've occupied and then been expelled from parts of Ukraine. Um, there is a question here over that classic issue of, uh, is this escalation or not? Um, but I think in many respects, the Ukrainians would simply argue that this is the front line straddling and are now being pushed back over an international border. In many respects, it mirrors what the Russians did when they tried to come in a few months back around Kharkiv. And do you think the Ukrainians can hold this territory for much longer that they've captured in Kursk? I I mean, I think that that is much more open to debate because extending their lines when they're already outnumbered all the way along the front line is risky. They're putting themselves uh, in within reach probably of more Russian helicopters, uh, attack aircraft, those glide bombs which were used to significant effect all the way along the front line. So unless they've bought a lot of air defences with them mm. or they've found some way of uh, jamming and interfering with Russian surveillance drones, then there is considerable risk. And that's what we mean when we say we don't yet know the scope of this operation. Do they intend to try and hold this territory for a short period and effectively trade it back for something else? Or are they genuinely trying to extend the front lines and hold it for much longer, looking forward to potential peace talks down the line. Well, and on that point, do you think this might be preparing the ground, you know, putting a few more chips on their side for some eventual negotiation about a final settlement? Something like this, which is taking territory, uh, probably embarrassing the Russians quite considerably, causing them to have to evacuate tens of thousands of Russians, could play into it. But then the question would be, how long are they intending to hold it? And when do they therefore think those talks might start? So. There are enormous risks about trying to consolidate and hold with some of their better units, mechanised, fast-moving units that they have pushed in to try and um, basically carve out this chunk. And of right. course, what we don't know is how much they genuinely control of it. There's lots of this that we're basically viewing through a very partial and open-source lens. OK, Matthew Seville, thank you very much indeed.